Okay, what's up? I think we've got everything set. So, let's uh, let's jump into it on this nice, or I, I don't know how it is in Wyoming, on this absolutely beautiful uh, Friday evening in Southern California. <sighs> All right, yeah, let's uh, let's do it. Let's get into the last part of 3.3 we're gonna end tonight with one of the coolest dang results i am so excited we're gonna talk about picard's great theorem and caserati the caserati weierstrass theorem it's a really good theorem um it's very cool um it's, it's got like a certain like oh nice kind of vibe about it to me i think it's just one of those results that makes you go like this this is why this is why we do this this is what it's all about so if you recall last time we were talking about the classification of singularities and just to refresh everyone's memories the whole gist of it was that we're using laurent series and um let me here one second i think i've got I think I had the music up a bit too loud. Um, anyways, we're classifying Laurent series, um, or we're, we're using Laurent series to classify singularities. The idea is basically like, let's just take Taylor series and kind of expand them using negative powers of N, right? So, you know, you're doing a regular Taylor series, you're taking Z minus Z naught to the one, to the zero, to the one, to the two, to the three, so on, right? Instead, we're going to do to the negative one, to the negative two, to the negative three, and put that little chunk on there too. So this little piece right here, the principal part, the part highlighted in red, this, uh, this guy kind of tells us how singular uh, singularities are. It's like, you know, how, how bad of a singularity is Z not, right? Kind of that business. Um, so here we're looking at in our, our classification, we were looking at analytic functions on deleted neighborhoods, and we're, we're, we're trying to figure out what these isolated singularities are like, right? Um, the centers of these deleted neighborhoods. Uh, we got poles. So this is when you have all but a finite number of terms in your uh, Laurent expansion. These guys are non-zero and everything else is zero okay we got poles of order k where k is the highest uh power of n in the denominator right you know highest power in the denominator for a non-zero coefficient um when you just have the first little term right here then that's a simple pole because it's pretty easy um then if you have an infinite number the bk is non-zero that's an essential singularity it's about as badly singular as it could be um the b1 term that first coefficient is called the residue when you have all the bk is zero then it's a removable singularity think of something like z over z in a deleted neighborhood of zero this thing is just one right so there that's its laurent expansion it's one right crazy all right cool so Removable singularities, it's like it's it's only there because of an accident of how we've written it, basically. Think of it like that. Um, so meromorphic functions uh, are analytic functions except for poles. Some, you know, like that, that sort of business. Um, just imagine, you know, you've got analytic functions, except maybe, except not at a couple of points, then uh, you've got a meromorphic function. Just a mild uh, extension. Uh, meromorphy... Think of it like you have something that's analytic on a set, and then maybe it's not analytic on a slightly like slightly bigger set, but it's analytic all but a f couple of places. That's meromorphic. Um, so just kind of a way to extend analyticity to larger domains and study those the the properties that carry over in that. And we do it using the Laurent expansion. We get a nice analog of um Cauchy's theorem where we can evaluate things in terms of the residue that's that first non-zero term and this is a great place to transition into what we're talking about today which is uh a little bit more about classifying these singularities so if you have f 
analytic on a region A and an isolated singularity at Z naught. So that's just, you know, there's some region A and then you've got a point in there, um, not in A itself because it wouldn't be analytic right there, right? Um, there's some point where it's got an isolated singularity, um, analytic all around that point, basically. Think of it like a punctured disk, that business. So if Z naught is a removable singularity, that is the same. So removable singularity is the same if and only if any one of these following conditions hold. So all these conditions mean the same thing as removable singularity. One, F is bounded in a deleted neighborhood of Z naught. Fair enough. The limit as Z goes to Z naught of F of Z exists. And then if you multiply by Z minus Z naught and take the limit, you get zero, right? So think about uh, the situation easy situation uh think of like f of z is say like z over z right okay uh what's uh is this guy bounded in a neighborhood of zero z not in this case is zero yeah absolutely it's constant in a neighborhood of zero does the limit as we go to z not exist yeah is the limit of this guy as you go to zero exist yeah it's one um and if you multiply by z then you get what so f of z times z in this case because z naught is zero well this is just equal to z right so the, the the key example to remember is this guy right if you remember this it makes all of these sort of obvious right um nearby it's uh it's not going too crazy basically think of it like that um Something like 1 over Z is the other one to think of where you don't have this, right? Um, if you just had 1 over Z, then it's definitely not bounded in a neighborhood of 0, right? That's even true in the real case. It flies off towards positive and negative infinity. Um, in the complex case, of course, along the real axis, the same thing happens. And in modulus, the it, it gets messy in other directions, too. Um, the limit as you go to 0 also doesn't exist and uh, multiply by z and in that case you would get one not zero hmm all right so those are the two examples to think of think of f of z is uh, z over z for the removable case and then to think of what breaks for non-removable singularities just think of one over z nothing too fancy okay fair enough so removable singularity exact same as these three conditions uh, simple pole is exactly the same as having the limit as z goes to z naught of z minus z naught, that quantity, times f of z. So the same thing we get in item c right here, exist and be unequal to zero. Once again, think of the example of f of z as one over z. If we multiply by z and take the limit as z goes to zero, well, we'll just get what? We'll get one because z times one over z is one everywhere except at zero right we're back in this case right here so then we would you know not get zero it exists but it's not equal to zero yeah all right the limit equals the residue of f at z naught so it's kind of a good formula right here actually the residue and some people write this different way ways of f at z naught so if you write this maybe as res f z naught maybe i don't know people like to write this a number of different ways this guy is equal to the limit as z goes to z naught of z minus z naught f of z easy we now have a formula for that so um in this nice previous formula where we figured out how to uh you know, calculate a contour integral in terms of that residue. We now have a way to do it, right? Um, kind of neat. All right. So you can calculate that residue just in terms of a limit like this, easy. Um, maybe the limit actually isn't easy to calculate. That can definitely happen. But uh, conceptually, it's not so different than this first case. Essentially, all of this just builds out in this theorem. So Here's how you can tell if you've got a removable singularity. Just kind of consider the examples of z over z and one and one over z. 
notice the difference between z over z and one over z totally sums up what's going on in part two right here. Um, that is, this thing exists, but it's not equal to zero like it is in this case. Okay, next little chunk. Z naught is a pole of order less than or equal to K, or possibly a removable singularity, if you want to consider a removable singularity as a pole of order zero, um, if any one of the following conditions hold. That is, uh, being a pole of order less than or equal to K is exactly the same as all of the following. One of them is that there's a constant, M, greater than zero, strictly greater than zero, in fact, and an integer K greater than or equal to one, such that f is bounded above by m over z minus c naught to the k. Okay, this is kind of obvious if you think about the Laurent expansion, right? Um, that is, if you've got f of z is like, you know, some, uh, think, think of writing it out like you've got your uh, analytic part, or just write it like this, right? Um, I'll just write it like this, minus infinity to infinity of like, a k z minus c naught to the k right so if it's got a pole of order k right that means that uh you know uh, less than or equal to k or something let me just go back to this slide so pole of order k happens when all but a finite number of these b coefficients are zero and if k is the highest integer that's a pole of order k. So looking here, if you got, you know, all the way back to some, you know, it's like n is the last one that's non zero, everything after that is zero, right? So kind of looking at this, uh, oh, I'm spoiling the surprise. Kind of looking at this business right here. Basically, that's like saying you can stop this bottom one at some point and not have any problem happen. That is like you could maybe just get rid of this infinity and make this like minus. Uh, n. Maybe I should have used an n here instead of a k. Sorry, that's bad use of k's twice. If that's it, maybe I'll make those n's really quick if you guys are fine with that looking super confusing. Looks messy. n's. And now this is k's. Okay. So this goes from like minus k, right? Minus k. And those are n's now. Sorry. Looks awful. But basically, you see, um, having a pole of order k means you can stop this bottom part like there, and it's fine. Um, and in that case, what we're saying is that we're bounded above by something like this, right? Pole of order less than or equal to K. Why does this happen? Well, just think about like one over Z compared to one over Z squared near zero. Near zero. If you put in say like one half into one over Z, then you would get out two. But if you put one half into one over Z squared, you would pick up four, right? So one over z squared grows, even in the real case, just thinking in the real case, grows much faster than one over z near zero, right? And so this is basically saying exactly the same thing. If you're bounded above by this guy, right, then you're, you know, you're a pole of order less than or equal to k. That is the piece where you cut off. Definitely can't be bigger, right? That is like, you know, um, it is not true that one over Z is bounded by um, one over Z squared, right? Like near, near zero, right? Um, and then similarly, we're just gonna extend exactly all of these things before. Bounded and deleted neighborhoods, you know, okay. This is exactly what's going on. It's not, it's not bounded by a constant. Now it's bounded by a fraction like this, right? By like, you know, an approximately one over, z to the z to the k kind of rate there might be a constant it might be shifted over a little bit but you know kind of kind of acting like bounded it, acting like something that's bounded by one over z to the k sort of business right um then exactly the same as when you have uh this guy equal to zero right here we're getting exactly the same uh business here with the k plus one right Pole of order less than or equal to k. If you put more than k and you get zero, right? And then when you put k, it has to at least exist. Nothing too crazy. So we're just basically extending these guys, throwing k's in 
exactly where you expect to see them, which is on the powers of Z. All right, and I'm gonna highlight that too, just to make it clear that that's our bounding function. Um, and then having a pole of order K greater than one is the same as, and this is saying like your, your, your order is less than this. Here's when you have a pole of order greater than one. If there, and this is the cool piece, this is what we'll use kind of a lot. If and only if, so having a pole of order k greater than one is exactly the same as there being an analytic function, let's call it phi, defined on an open on a neighborhood u of z naught, not necessarily open, a uh, neighborhood u of z naught, such that the punctured neighborhood u at z naught, just take z naught out of u, puncture it out, um, that's obviously contained in a, um, with f satisfies the following: um, phi of z naught is non-zero. And, and this is, this is the cool piece, this, sorry, that part made me stumble, get tongue-tied. Um, there's a nice domain, U, which, um, if you pull out Z0, is contained in A. And there's an analytic function phi defined on this domain, which has phi of Z0 not, not equal to 0. And F of Z is phi of Z over Z minus Z0 to the K. This means that meromorphic functions, functions with poles of order k, um, are basically just an analytic function divided by z minus c naught to the k. In fact, that's exactly what they are. But what this means in a very real sense is that uh, meromorphic functions are locally, at least, ratios of holomorphic functions. They're basically the rational functions of the holomorphic world, except up to potentially this top piece maybe not actually being a polynomial, if that makes sense. But at least, uh, since it's analytic, it is at least representable as, you know, like a very long polynomial, and in fact, an infinitely long polynomial, right, by Taylor's theorem. So, kind of cool. All right, so this is a cool, uh, cool trick. It is useful. Um, and let's just kind of think about what this what this all means. So obviously this holds when it makes sense. Uh, this is what it says down here, Z not equal to Z not. If you tried plugging Z not in there, it would be a mess. Um, anyways, basically what this is all saying is that if uh, F has a pole of order K, at uh, z naught, then f is like one over z to the k, or I should say one over z minus z naught, really, right, to the k. Um, near z naught. Probably the, this looks this looks messier. I, I hate writing it this way. Really, what I want to say is this, um, and I'll put these in quotes to make everything feel nicer. It's like one over z to the k, right? It basically acts like that. You know, just think of like the shape of what that function looks like. Um, this is like how having a zero of order k, um, I'll say at z naught means f is like, uh, gosh, I can't write today, z to the k, like z to the k, near z naught, right? Remember from 3.2? When we were talking about having a zero of order k, if you don't recall, uh, going back to 3.2 right now, here's our lecture from 3.2. This was all about when we were looking at our Taylor expansion, right? And saying, hey, these guys, these terms, um, if you have the first, say, like, you know, it, k minus one of them equal to zero, and then you finally get one that's non zero, then you have a zero of order k. Obviously, having uh, the first k minus one terms equal to zero means that the function evaluated at that point is zero since that's one of the terms in the Taylor series, right? So this, this just think about how like near that point, um, you know, if you look at like what the Taylor expansion actually is, 
then the z minus whatever that point is, you know, um, to the k, that's the first term that appears. And so it's, it's, it's basically that's like the first thing you see if you want to think of it like that, right? Um, and so that's pretty much deciding kind of what it looks like near that point, right? Similarly, uh, if you are at a pole, you're acting like the opposite. So zeros and poles play kind of a nice dual role. Yeah, that, that seems really sensible. And in fact, we can make this way more precise and we're about to after I take a drink. Okay, so proposition 3.3.5. Here, we're just going to start with F and G analytic in a neighborhood of Z naught with zeros there of order N and K respectively. So we could take, you know, a zero of order zero if a function is not zero, kind of like how I was saying, if you have, you know, have a um, removable singularity, it's like having a pole of order zero, right? Um, so... And in fact, if you think of it like that, all of these theorems right up here um, just work out exactly like that. So having, you know, pole of order zero, think of taking z minus z naught to the zero. Well, that just gives you the limit of z goes to z naught of f of z. Hey, look, that's from right up here. That's this piece, right? Take k equals zero right here. Oh, you've recovered boundedness in a deleted neighborhood of z naught, just like in this piece right here. Yeah, see? Um, so same, same business, take K equals zero. Oh, look, B is exactly the same as C right there. So what I'm trying to say is that, um, you know, stop making it more complicated in your head if you, uh, if you don't want to, um, just, you know, think of allowing zero to have zero of order zero is some is, is not a zero right of the function and um a pole of order zero is a removable singularity right um anyways so we'll define h to be f over g okay fair enough if k is uh so order n and k respectively k is the order of the zero at z naught for g and n is the order for f. If k is greater than n, then h has a pole of order k minus n. Sensible. Sensible. Okay. But uh, the kind of idea to think of right here, if you just want to make everything easy in your head and seem obvious, is imagine that like f uh, of z is like, say, bugging uh, out there, z to the n and g of z is say like z to the k and z naught is equal to zero imagine that then take f over g and if k is bigger than n then you just have one over z to the k minus n so obviously h would have a pole of order k minus n okay fair enough so you start with the the one on the bottom having a bigger zero larger order zero then you get a pole of order that so one easy way to also think about this is if you just take like g to be z to the k and f to be like one right so it has a pole of order or a zero of order zero then obviously this says that you know exactly what we we're saying before like one over z to the k oh look having a zero of order k means you're like one over z to the k or it means like you're like z to the k near z naught so of course it'd be like one over z to the k if you flip your function over obviously so pretty sensible so far if k is equal to n then you get a removable singularity oh we're back at our nice and familiar place where we're talking about z over z or z to the n over z to the n it's a pretty obvious kind of thing so if k is n then we have removable singularity nice with a non-zero limited z naught but hey we all know that having a removable singularity is the same as having a limit at uh zena right 
Okay. And if k is less than n, then h has a removable singularity at h has a removable singularity at z naught. And setting h of z naught equal to zero produces an analytic function with zeros of order n minus k at z. Ooh, okay, this is like taking, say, for example, z squared over z, right? Ah, huh. kind of cool. Kind of cool. All right, everything feels just, you can just exactly get it all from just thinking of z to the n over z to the k and imagining the various values of n and k. Nothing fancy. So let's at least kind of prove this. I'm not going to prove this one uh, up here just because there are too dang many statements in it and none of them are hard to prove, but um, it just would take a really long time to write it all down or talk through it. So let's just prove this one really quick. Um, so we know that there's a neighborhood D, which is uh, we're going to take that to be the set of Z. Uh, it, it will just take it to be the disk of open disk centered at z and out of radius uh, r, right? Um, we know that there's such a neighborhood on which f and g factor as f of z is z minus z naught to the n times phi of z, and g of z is z minus z naught to the k times psi of z. Now, why is this? Why is this? Recall back from 3.2 that we got this... Um, got this right where is it oh here in proposition 3.2.9 it's exactly right down here right so in the latter case there's a function phi of z analytic on this disk with you know exactly we're just exactly stating this consequence of proposition 3.2.9 so we can factor these guys as z minus z naught to the n and z minus z naught to the k and then some additional functions phi and psi which are analytic and never zero in D. Then if you take the function H to be phi over psi, this is also analytic and never equal to zero because it's the ratio of two analytic functions that are not equal to zero. Okay, then for Z in this uh, deleted neighborhood, you can obviously look at this and, uh, oh, hey, you got H right here is non-zero and then Z to the Z minus C naught to the N minus K. Well, would you look at that? We're just exactly getting what we got when we were thinking about cases like this before because this guy is non-zero. And so everything up here when we're taking all of these limits works out totally fine, right? Um, just do all the limits and everything really just comes through exactly fine. And you get, you know, corresponding to each one exactly the results you want. Now, what, what do I mean by that? So think about in the case where uh, k equals n, right? Then this is just going to be z minus z naught to the zero, for example. And you just have h of z right here, which is non-zero. And would you look at that if we take the limit as this goes to z naught? And um, we'll get that it exists and so on and so on. Um, and is unequal to zero, of course, right? So it's a simple pull. Bottom boom, easy. Okay, anyways, so we'll just move on from that. Um, it just comes from using 3.2.9, which is very commonly used in conjunction um, with, like this, that type of result is very commonly used in conjunction with results about poles because it's very often the case that we want to, you know, divide by something. And so, of course, we're just switching zeros and poles. And if you ever do any, uh, if, for the engineers in the class, if you end up ever doing any control theory and you work in, say, the, uh, the, the frequency domain, um, there are a lot of things where you'll be dealing with poles. And then if you want to move over into the state space domain, you'll end up flipping it over and turning everything in to zeros. And um, it's, a, it's a good trick. You'll see these kinds of results a lot in certain disciplines of engineering. Um, there's practical applications, but let's get on to the way more interesting part, um, than, you know, ratios of polynomials for all intents and purposes and talk about the cool stuff, the essential singularities that is, yeah, sure. Okay. If you have a pole of order K, then you're acting like one over Z to the K near your pole. It's not any weirder than acting like Z to the K near a zero of order K. But what about for essential singularities? This is way different because if you notice, we don't have zeros of order infinity, 
right? A zero of order infinity, the only function that has that is, I guess, zero, right? At least amongst analytic functions, right? Something that's identically zero. But you have non-identically zero functions that have um, essential singularities, right? And if you think about like one over z to the infinity or something, it's kind of like, I don't know, what? Sort of like zero, or I don't know. It's a it's a kind of confusing thing right there, and we've seen this before with say like e to the one over z, which we uh, messed with at, at I think in three point. Do we do this at just the very beginning? Maybe of no, we did this last time in three point two. Right at the start, uh, we computed this out, and I mean we've seen this even for things like um, one over z times z minus one. Uh, yeah, we did this for uh, 1 over z. And we got 1 plus 1 over z plus 1 over 2 factorial z squared plus 1 over 3 factorial z cubed and so on. Notice there are just in going to be infinitely many um, uh, terms that have a z to the something on the bottom. And uh, they'll have a non-zero coefficient. So I keep going back to the wrong thing. There we go. Um, all right. So... So this is a uh, this is going to be a crazy one. Um, this is very different from thinking about zeros of order something, right? What goes on with essential singularities? They're kind of a mystery so far to us in this class. It, I seriously doubt that anyone has an intuition as to what should happen, and I'm sure you can read what's on the screen, so you'll figure out what does happen just from that, but. Let's talk about it so we can really digest just how truly crazy it is. Um, and so let me back off from talking it up and just actually talk about it. So obviously, in most cases, singularities are poles, but it's it gets weirder when you talk about singularities that aren't poles. When you have a singularity that's a pole, it acts like 1 over z of the k. So as you go to, you know... Uh, if you go towards z naught, then f of z, in modulus at least, goes towards infinity. Just like in the real case, right? Go toward 1 over z, go towards 0, you fly off to infinity in absolute value, right? Okay, so that's obvious. But in the case of an essential singularity, this is not always the case. In fact, something much, much, much weirder happens. Modulus of f does not in general approach infinity as z goes to z naught. The crazy fact of it is that f approaches every value except potentially 1 as z goes towards its, uh, its essential singularity. That's crazy. That means that modulus f could go towards literally anything. Um, and in fact, in general, the limit doesn't exist. Um, but I mean, similar to how this limit doesn't exist, but it doesn't exist in a much crazier way, meaning that if you just, you know, d depending on your direction of approach, you go towards totally different things. It's, it's nuts. It's insane. So the big daddy theorem of it, which requires some machinery that is so far beyond what we'll deal with in this class is Picard's theorem, uh, the great Picard theorem in contrast to Picard's little theorem, which we um, are not talking about right now. Uh, the Picard theorem, the great Picard theorem, um, if you're Russian, you might also notice like what uh, Scott, Scotsky's, I, I don't remember the name, Scotsky's theorem, something like that. Um, uh, Picard's theorem anyway, is uh, if you have an essential singularity f has an essential singularity at z naught, and u is any arbitrarily small deleted neighborhood of z naught, u is any arbitrarily small deleted neighborhood of z naught, then for every single value in the complex plane, except perhaps one, the equation f of z equals w has infinitely many solutions, not just in general, in u. So no matter how close you are, the image of any deleted neighborhood hits every point, except potentially one, infinitely many times. What? The absolute, like, what? How? How? If that's not blowing your mind, then you've, you've truly lost your sense of wonder. That's so weird. That's so, like, I've ne you never see a result like that, right? Like, when does that happen? When do you 
you know, just, oh, here, hey, I've thrown something messy in the denominator, right? Like, oh, well, turns out that, you know, every equation you could use has uh, infinitely many solutions. That's weird, right? Like, if I said, hey, does e to the 1 over z hit every possible value in the complex plane infinitely many times for z near 0? You'd be like, eh, seems kind of far-fetched. Like, that that seems a little bit crazy, right? No, totally. It just does it. That's it's so weird, right? Um, and maybe um, since we can't we can't prove the Picard theorem with the tools we have, maybe it'll seem a little bit more amazing when you look at just how short uh, the, the 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 more introductory version of the Picard theorem, which we do have the tools to prove. Um, is it has such a short proof it's like such a little result that um, it's nuts to me it just seems so weird um, the Kazarati Weierstrass theorem is like the 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 little brother you know like a, it's like the son of Picard's theorem um, the 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 tiny guy um, it's it, it's a piece that builds up to it later um, the Kazarati Weierstrass theorem is a in some ways, perhaps, it, it, is, it is properly weaker than Picard's theorem, to be clear. I'm not trying to say it's better in any formal sense. However, I'm trying to say that the, the piece of Picard's theorem that it highlights is, I think, in some ways, more illustrative of how cool all this is. So, let me switch to a different color and make our highlighting cool. Um, so, if F has an isolated essential singularity at Z0, and W is some point in the complex plane then there is a sequence of value z in the complex plane such that the sequence converges to z naught and f of that sequence converges to w what if you want to see a picture think of it like this think about here we've got two copies of c yeah and I mean, I always draw it so you can see like the, you know, axes or something because it makes it easier, I guess, to visualize. Um, but anyways, we've got two copies of C. Um, and I'm using F, I'm flying over with F, right? Okay, cool. Now let's pick a point Z naught. And what we get is um, pick any point over here. Let's call this W. Here's the cool business is that if you if you want to uh, get to W, right, then all you have to do is follow some path into Z naught and F will take you through to some path that gets to W. It's amazing. And if you want like a different point, like, you know, like, let's call it W tilde, then all you need to do is just move around a little bit. Now, if you go in to this one, say, from, say, like, like there exists some direction, so that if you go in like this, then on the other side, you'll end up um, going to W naught via some other path, right? Like, this blue path gets mapped over by F to, like, that path, right? And it ends up hitting there. So it's kind of like this weird thing that says like, and notice, notice there's nothing special at all about like all these weird curves I'm drawing right here. If you just looked very close, you know, all but infinitely many terms or all but finitely many terms of the sequence have to be in here, right? I, I'm drawing it like a path because if it holds for a sequence and it certainly holds for a path. Um, but, you know, you, you, you this still works too. You end up end up with like a different littler chunk of the path right over there, right? You know? Um, and right over here. So realistically, it's like you can do this on as small of a disk about Z0 as you want, obviously. Um, and I'm drawing these like they're paths instead of sequences, and that's fine too. But basically, it says that pick any point over in the complex plane, and you can zoom in from some direction to your essential singularity and at the same time, be zooming in towards that point in the image. It's weird. It's so weird. It means that your angle of approach 
like slightly change it and you can end up like at a totally different part of the complex plane and there's no part of the complex plane that you can't get to just by kind of changing your angle of approach it's like um like a little dial that when you turn it takes you to literally anywhere you want in the entire complex plane it's the, the i don't know man it feels like, like a time machine where you can just like turn like history forward and backwards or something you know it's like it's like whoa like what that's like a way too powerful of a lever to have right here like that's a that's nuts and that's pretty cool um so let's prove this guy really quick and then that'll be a great great conclusion to our friday we can all feel wonderful and you can go have uh uh my you can go have some beers with your friends and talk about the Casarati wire stress theorem or some root beers um you're all undergraduates um or most of you some of some of you can have beers yeah you should some of you can maybe let's prove this theorem <laughs> um so proof if there were no such sequence uh in the sequence of z ends you know going uh to z naught if there were no such sequence then that means there is some epsilon greater than zero and some delta greater than zero such that f of z minus w in modulus the distance from f of z to w is greater than epsilon for all z in the deleted neighborhood given by a disk of radius delta centered at z naught without z naught right so we're going to call that u that's the deleted neighborhood and on u f of z minus w is strictly greater than epsilon in modulus f of z is strictly further away from w strictly epsilon further away from w at least right okay obviously if it's at least epsilon away from w it's definitely never equal to w in u right because it's at least epsilon away from it so the function g of z given by one over f of z minus w well that's analytic in u the denominator is never equal to zero and it's just you know uh one over analytic minus constant right so it's still yeah, it's still going to be analytic right analytic in u and if you want to go through i think there's actually an error right here um and uh in modulus it should be less than one over who the textbook author made a mis mistake one over epsilon in modulus right oh wait a second it's bounded it's bounded by it's bounded in a neighborhood in a deleted neighborhood of uh of z naught ooh ooh bounded in a deleted neighborhood of z naught what does that mean well any singularity at z naught is removable right that's just what we were doing before right bounded in a deleted neighborhood oh we started off today Oh, bound in a deleted neighborhood, so it's removable. Now, the values of G can't constantly be zero near Z naught. Does that seem reasonable? Well, look at how G is defined. If it was zero near uh, Z naught, right? It, F is not arbitrarily large everywhere near Z naught, right? It might get really big near Z naught. You could say that or something but it can't be really big on an entire neighborhood and still be defined and good that would be not okay can't constantly be zero near near z naught since f is not i hate how they say this constantly infinite right because it has to you know it could it could maybe get close as we go towards z naught or something like that but it couldn't be going towards infinity for all uh value as you approach all values in a neighborhood of z naught while still also being well defined at those values, obviously. Um, so, you know, this is the isolation of the singularity, right? That it's not surrounded by a whole neighborhood of other singularities, right? It's just one point, one isolated singularity. Okay, now from corollary 3.2.8, let's look back at corollary 3.2.8 to make sure we're all good. I actually box this one, so it's a, it's a good one. Um, so if A is a region in C, and f is a complex valued function defined on a then f is analytic on a that's exactly the same 
is saying that each for each z naught in A, there's a number r greater than zero such that the disk centered at z naught of radius r contained in A is contained in A and f equals a convergent power series on that disk. So basically it says that every uh, every analytic function has a convergent power series representation uh, near uh, on some disk near any every point in its domain right a domain of analyticity right so so from this corollary any zero of g at z naught is isolated why well because just like we've been saying before zeros and poles kind of serve a dual role so we put this um, or singularity, right? We've put this isolated singularity in the, you know, denominator right here. So that would be a potentially, you know, it'd be a zero, an isolated zero, obviously, and has finite order K. Oh, why does it have finite order? Well, back over here. Now, if we are looking at, um, things with, uh, we've got, we've got limits that exist and all that. Um, everything looks all good, right? So it means it has finite order. After all, an essential singularity is not removable, right? Oh, but wait, f of z is, or er, f of z, just, you know, solve this for f of z. That's w plus one over g. But wait, if it has a zero of order k, then if k is zero, that means that f is analytic, right? Because being a zero of order zero means that you're that G is non-zero, right? So if uh, G has a zero of order K that isn't zero, so then um, you get a pole of order K, right? That's by three point three point five. Is that? No, 3.3.5 is right here. Just uh, exactly the same way right here, right? Just, you know, flipping it over. You know, this is the case where F is 1 and G is, well, scrolling too much. G is just G, see? 1 and G, right? And we're adding a constant, but that won't change anything. So that's, that's from Proposition 3.3.5. But wait... This, all con this would all contradict the hypothesis that F has an essential singularity. Because if if you have a essential singularity at Z, at Z naught, then you certainly don't, you aren't analytic at Z naught, and you definitely don't have a pole of order K, because an essential singularity is a pole of infinite order, right? You know, a pole of order K for any finite K, right? So that's that's the gist of it. All you do is you just construct this function noticing that f is uh, bounded away from w if you suppose the contrary and then you get a contradiction to it being an essential singularity this is exactly saying what the casaretti weierstrass theorem says which is that you can't be bounded away from any point in the image if um you have an essential singularity so whatever small neighborhood you choose deleted neighborhood you choose of z naught then you can find a sequence of points going into Z naught such that F carries that sequence on through to a sequence of points that goes to whatever point you want in the whole complex plane. Another way to write this, another way to think about this is um, this is a corollary um, to Kazerati Weierstrass. Um, if F has an essential singularity at z naught then for any neighborhood um, let's call it u of z naught f of u and we'll do like a little little uh, set minus z naught so a neighborhood of z naught means a set containing an open set that contains z naught 
right? So if I pull this out, then I have at least some little tiny ball around Xenon. Okay, but this guy is dense in C, in the complex plane. What does dense mean? All it means is that... Uh, I should make that a semicolon, i.e. Um, F of U set minus Z naught, this punctured set, if I close it, I don't remember, did we write that as CL? I don't think we wrote it instead as uh, with like an overline, right? So this means take all the limit points, right? That's what Casarati Weierstrass is saying, is it's saying like, hey, take all your limit points, right? They, like if you look at the limits of all these guys, you get, well, everything. It means that no matter how small of a little circle you choose around any point, send it on over with F, what you get out is arbitrarily close to every single point in the complex plane. It's got a dense image. So you have, if you have an essential singularity, then you have a dense image under or any, any deleted neighborhood of that essential singularity has a dense image under that mapping. That's nuts. That is so dope. That is one of the coolest results I've ever seen. And it is, uh, I think, I think it's more illustrative than Picard's great theorem, though Picard's great theorem is stronger. Um, because Picard's great theorem t says that, um, you actually hit all but perhaps one point. Um, well, the Kazarati Weierstrass theorem says that you just uh, get close to hitting every single point, right? Here, Picard's theorem says you actually hit all of them, except maybe one of them. These points are interesting for a number of reasons. They're called uh, lacunary points, l lacunary values, um, like a lacuna, you know, lacunary. Um, so I, we won't talk more about the Picard theorem or anything like that. This is mostly just a interesting diversion so far, but god dang if it isn't weird, right? Uh, basically, the intuition you should take away from this is that essential singularities um, get pretty wild, and they can get they can get near... As, as you get close to essential singularity, your function gets pretty weird. That is, just changing your direction of approach can totally change where you end up in the complex plane, right? You, you can no longer make statements all nice and easy like, well, if I just am going towards it, I might as well just go along this line and see what it goes towards, you know? Because if you go on a slightly different line towards the exact same point, you could be going towards a totally different place in the complex plane. Um, pretty weird, right? Arbitrarily small deviations making uh, arbitrarily large changes in the output. Um, kind of, it's not, it's not an instance of this, but sort of feels like, you know, uh, in a colloquial sense, like butterfly effect sort of thing, you know, um, it's not the case, but y y you get what I mean. Like it just, it changes it kind of a lot. It's, um, it's not at least technically that sense in a colloquial sense it is, but yeah, it's weird. It's wild. It means you do the essential singularities are crazy. Cool. I guess we'll just end it there. I'll stop ranting about how much I like the Casarati Weierstrass theorem. That's basically the end of this section. Um, small bit of good news for everybody is uh, I finally finished grading your exams. I will put those in right after I uh, put my son to bed and eat a slice of pizza. And um, you can see them either later tonight um, if you want to or um, perhaps in the morning if you don't want your night to be ruined. I'm just kidding. Uh, everyone did pretty good. Um, I was actually very uh, impressed, and I want to take a second to say that um, good job. You guys are killing it, and I was um, very much impressed with some of the ingenuity and uh, well-thought-out approaches I saw. Everyone really seemed to give it a very good shot, and um, proud of you guys. Very cool. So let's, uh, let's call it quits for the day, and uh, have an awesome weekend. Bye.